Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Grace Hour, our program that takes a dive into the believer's daily challenges and helps them to learn their faith in a practical way. Uh, My name is Pastor Matt Garrett. I'm the director of Maryland Bible College and Seminary, and I am joined today by the wonderful, (laughs) awesome, amazing director of the Young Adults Ministry at Greater Grace World Outreach and the Bible College professor who teaches about the topic we're going to cover today. This is a special Monday episode where you get to see Philippe and I before our time on Tuesdays, and our topic today is what is Christian ethics? So I'm going to start off very briefly here, give a definition of ethics in the secular world, the ethics that you would study in a four-year university or college, the ethics that are talked about or maybe not talked about so much anymore and and actually maybe kind of thrown away a little bit. But here's here's a working definition for the word ethics uh, as a as an idea. It's a, the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. And so I'm going to kick it right yeah. over here to Philippe and we are going to talk about you know the difference between Christian ethics and yeah. secular ethics. Yeah, I mean, it's the our topic today is defining what is Christian ethics, and I think it's important to say a few things before we do. Number one is there, there is a distinction between a secular anything versus Christian anything. Sure. Not in the sense where the Christians are better or this is that we have a reason behind what we do, right? So one way to define that would say make a difference between the word morals and the word ethics. The morals is is the right and wrongs that we do, uh, you know, like uh, every day. Um, so it's morally right to do this, morally wrong to do this, and it's based on the philosophy of what it is, which is what we call ethics. So mm-hmm. that's the difference between morals and ethics. Mm-hmm. And so we have this, and then tomorrow we'll talk about something that is even a little, takes it a little bit deeper, which is who decides what is right and what is wrong, right? So, and and basically, if we would answer the question very simply, we would say our ethics decides what is more right, what is more wrong. Our philosophy, what is, what motivates my behavior behind me. And that is the very specific distinction between a secular ethics versus a Christian ethics. And that's why it needs to be defined, you know, in such a way. So, yeah. That's great. Um, This class, we actually introduced it to our Bible college track, Two years ago, we did. Yeah, uh, we hadn't. We had not had an ethics course in our four-year program, and maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. Why did we introduce Christian ethics to yeah. our Bible college track? How is it useful uh, for a Bible college student? I'm thinking very similarly of the the topics of psychology yeah. in secular college, and then biblical psychology, which yes. we teach here yes. at Maryland Bible College and Seminary. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the idea behind is this, uh, is when I was in your, in your seat, you know, as a director of the college, we just realized a few things. Number one is that I think our young people struggle with the difference that, that we observe now in society. Okay, so if you take America 40 years ago, America was a Christian nation. It's not a Christian nation anymore, and it's you know, it's day-to-day operations, you could say this way. And 40 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, people could be Christians and don't find themselves at odds with the world in many areas because people were morally impacted by the Christian nature of what the country used to be. Mm -hmm. It's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out there and then there is like a pendulum reaction to a very Christian (laughs) heart nation to a very walk to use the word that people don't like but let's put it this way where we are really advanced in going far away from christianity so it puts our young people in a place where they've never been before which is now they have to realize okay the world does not agree with what i hear in the church now i hear one thing in the church i hear a different thing in the university i hear one thing you know in, in my family or my friends and i hear something else in my youth ministry for example how do i deal with this so there's always two things you can do with young people. One is a mistake, which you tell them what to, what to believe, right? That's mm-hmm. a mistake. Right. Or you can do the right thing, which is telling them what to believe and why. And that and that's so that's why the class was introduced in Bible college mm-hmm. to say, okay, guys, we understand that this world is going away from God, and we're going to tell you things that are going to put you at odds with what you hear in the world. But let me tell you why. Let mm-hmm. us tell you why we believe this is important. Mm-hmm. Just like in the same thing we do with apologetics, right. which is the defense of the faith. Uh, yeah, you can believe this, but tell me why I believe this myself. You know, mm-hmm. So it's the same thing. That's the reason why um, we, we introduced the class you know, two years ago. Very cool. Yeah. No, I think it's a great addition. I know it's one of the most attended classes on our campus. 
uh, it's very cool to, to watch the interaction that takes place in the class. You ask yeah. a lot of great questions and you ask for a lot of student participation, yeah. which is, which is something they don't get all the time <laughs> in Bible college. If it's a lecture course, they may not, they may not have a lot to say yeah. during the class. And this is one of their opportunities to speak up. Um, what, you know, what's your philosophy behind conversation in the classroom and allowing for the debate to take place, allowing for the differences of opinions to surface? Yeah. And how, how does that affect like the, the class in general or just, just the conversation of ethics on a broader sc- scale, Christian ethics? Yeah, I think, well, interesting. So half of the class is lecturing, the other half is like interaction. So the work is prepped, you know, they go in small groups, they have a quote or a topic they can discuss, I go around and discuss this topic. I think, I think people find it more comfortable to discuss dif- dif- difficult things when they're in small groups. Mm-hmm. It's three students and myself or whoever the teacher does that, and we have this conversation, and it stays between us. And move on to another group, we have a different conversation. I find it to be very effective into having them a place where they actually voice a question that maybe I didn't think to address in the class. So mm-hmm. I, I, this is very helpful. And I think it goes with what we're seeing with the reason why we have this class in, 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 in the Bible College, because we want them to be able to ask the questions why. We believe this. So I have students who bring up some very difficult topics, for example, you know, homosexuality in the mm-hmm. Bible, which is like a hot topic among Christians. Yeah. Because what we call the progressive church in one way would go down, you know, and abandon some of the landmarks of Christianity for the sake of being relevant in the world. Mm-hmm. And then the key things we were saying in the class is, no, wait, wait a minute, because the gospel is still relevant today, despite, you know. And what most people realize or don't realize is that the world we're in was impacted by Christianity for centuries, right. but the world in which Christianity began was worse ethically than the one we have. So mm. we think we're the first one to believe that we are facing all these moral dilemmas. Mm-hmm. Think about 20 centuries ago, where actually was no moral dilemmas at all, because there was no morals at all, and Christianity impacted the world to change that. So. The Gospels and the letters in the Bible were written at a time where the world was was chaos immorally. So we're doing good. We're fine. You know, and it means if it worked, it (laughs) transformed the whole world 20 centuries ago and Mm -hmm. until recently, it will work even today. Yeah. That's what we're saying. Awesome. Uh, There's this proverb that comes to mind. It's in a couple different places. I Mm -hmm. can't find it off the top of my head. But they both say something on, along the lines of remove not the ancient landmarks, yes. the landmarks which your fathers have set. Do you feel like this plays a role in Christian ethics? I mean, so we're talking about the difference between secular and Christian ethics, what makes Christian ethics distinctive. Yes. Uh, I think <clears throat> the number one answer to that, and, and we're, we're saying it already, but like the Bible yes. has to be the base for what we believe. Yes. Uh, you're teaching your students where in the Bible you find these issues, yes. where you find these topics, and how the inspired writers by the Holy Spirit address it. Yeah. So, so how does that? How does that? How do those two verses play an effect or play a role? Remove not the ancient landmarks. Well, or does it? No. It, yeah, it does very much so because in, in a way, one of the distinctive approach of Christian ethics is showing that our theology supersedes our ethics. That we define what we believe. Okay, so if let's, let's go back to the idea, like if if I, I made a distinction between morals or morality versus ethics, right? So we have three levels. Uh, in in, in non Christian ethics, you have morals. Yeah. And they, de- they depend on your education, your culture. There's absolutely no objective truth. Mm-hmm. And whatever is right for you is right for you. Right. right? So uh, we'll discuss that a little bit tomorrow in a different way, but that's one way. So in Christian morals, you have something that, that is beyond your morals, which is how do you decide what is right and what is wrong? There mm-hmm. is a higher authority. We believe that as a Christian. Mm-hmm. But how do you find this? Yeah. And that's your theology. Right. So you have theology that influences and defines your ethics, and mm-hmm. your ethics defines your, your, your morals, your behavior. So we could say truth impacts our thoughts, which impacts our behaviors, mm-hmm. and this is the Christian understanding of ethics. Because nice. ethics is not telling others how they're wrong. Ethics is first you being transformed in the ring of your mind as a Christian. Mm-hmm. So many times we look at others and say, well, you know, this world, you know, is horrible, but God is saying, well, you know, look at your speck first in your eye before you look at the beam in the other people's eyes. And it's true the ethics as well. Right. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm thinking of a, a passage in, in Peter's epistles where mm-hmm. he says, uh, always have an answer for the hope that is in you. Yes. And I think 
I think this plays a part in ethics in the fact that first you need to know where you stand. Yes. And why, and I mean, yeah, you've said this, why you believe what you believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that produces the answer that you give to someone yes. who may be coming from a, a totally different atmosphere, a totally different background, totally different culture. Yes. Uh, and just having that answer for them may be a little bit of light in their life that they that they have not yet like experienced before. Yeah, it's one thing it's surprising when I say something maybe the people don't connect sometimes ethics with redemption, but that's that's a very distinctive Christian approach. Like, okay, so Look about the cancel culture, for example, yeah. today. We look back and say, oh, all these horrible people in the back. So, of course, we we judge, you know, uh, other cultures, which is a history in the past. But if there is no God, there is no objective way of doing this. Mm -hmm. But even the Christians, if they do have an objective way of condemn, condemning, for example, uh, the Holocaust mm -hmm. as being morally wrong for, for specific biblical reasons, yeah. we also have a different way of handling our disagreements. And, and the point here is basically is that Forgiveness and redemption is a big part of what we believe is a true Christian ethics. So there is no place for cancel culture in, in, in our understanding as Christians. We don't cancel people just because they made a mess. We, 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 and then we don't, you know, the other thing is also, and that's one also of the distinctive Christian approach in understanding our ethics, is that not only we don't judge people in that way, but, but we don't even include that maybe in the conversation when we preach the gospel. What makes you and I who we are today is because we believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. I can tell you for sure, if I was not a Christian, I would completely go with the world and their agenda. Because yeah. I wouldn't have any objective way of defining what is right, right is wrong. Mm -hmm. So when I see someone who has, who lives in sin, that's what the Bible calls it. It's morally wrong with the living sin. Yeah. I don't care about that. What I care about their, I care about their soul, mm -hmm. you know. So you don't try to change someone because, because before they become a Christian. You try to preach the gospel, they get saved, and then they will change. Yeah. And that also is a Christian approach of, of, of Christian ethics. Right, yeah. The transformation comes with, from within. Yes. From the life of Christ inside them. I, I heard a preacher the other day, and I shared this with, with a few people. Uh, he said, he said uh, you know, someone came up to him and asked him, well, well, if I start believing in Jesus, am I going to have to give up marijuana? Am I going to have to give up this habit or that yeah. habit? And the preacher <laughs> said to him, he just stared him right in the face. He said, well, let me ask you something. Uh, when you go to get in the shower, do you have to get clean before you get in the shower? And yeah. <laughs> it's just like a really funny, yeah. really funny example. No, you don't, you don't have to get clean before you go into the shower. You go into the shower with to the purpose clean. of getting clean. Yeah. You go into this relationship with Christ. You, yeah. you start uh, basing your life on this, on this Christian standard of ethics because it like, it cleans out, it transforms yes. your life. It changes who you are from the inside out. Yeah. Uh, here, here's a crazy example that I was thinking of uh, because, because ethics can be, uh, relative, depending on what your base for them are. If it's yeah. not the Bible, it Especially can, be, if you're a Christian, it can yeah. be relative, right? So like uh, this, again, extreme example, <laughs> I'm not condoning this in any way. I'm just saying I could see this happening in a society in some way. Uh, we are at the point in our society today where slavery is is uh, outlawed. It, yes. is, it is horrible. You yes. can't do that. You can't enslave a person. You can't uh, indenture them and keep them as a servant all your life. Nothing like that, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens 100, 200, 300 years from now? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a cataclysmic event. Maybe there's something that wipes out half the world's population. Mm -hmm. And the people who are around don't know any better, and they start enslaving people for the sake of their own survival. Yes. Who's going to say that that's right or wrong? That's what that's what ethics on a shaky ground, ethics on yes. something that's not objective, something that's not outside of themselves. Yeah. That's what ethics can turn into. Yes. Well, at this point in history, slavery is fine. And at this point in history, no, slavery is outlawed. Yes. Like there's plenty of examples like that that we could go through whenever you look at ethics versus Christian ethics, yeah. where the Christian answer doesn't change. The biblical answer does not change. The word of God is set in mm -hmm. stone. It endures forever for all yes. generations. So I don't know, just food for thought. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, uh, you know, anticipating the the topic tomorrow. But what we could right. say, yeah, what we could say is is in one way is that it, it is true unless you have an objective view of ethics, unless your ethics is grounded in something that doesn't change, then your morals will change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, but the the funniest part for me, this is when people don't have any belief 
any transcendent belief. They don't believe in God or anything. They basically believe that morals are relatives. They can change depending. Oh, what we, you know, back in the day, we, you know, you, you had to be married, you know, uh, to have children. Now it's fine. You can have children out of wedlock. So you see, our society is better than the other ones. It's less repressive. Mm -hmm. But the point here is, is it's interesting because we look back and say, you know. Uh, our different times brought different ethics and we should be okay with this. That's how we justify our behavior today. But if we really believe this, then you cannot go back and judge everybody else's view. Exactly. Or even yes. current societies. Like, like, for example, let's look at the the World Cup in, in, in Qatar. You sure. know, I'm not so interested in the World Cup you know, in, in one way, but I want, what I find it very interesting is, is people who tell you that morals are relative Try to make a mess, you know, in in Qatar by having, you know, what kind of T-shirts, whatever they want, so they make a statement like, you know, we're like we're better than you. But then, if ethics is absolutely not objective, who t says? Who are you to say that your morals are better than theirs? Right. You know, on what ground? Especially if you believe that there is no God and you believe in evolution, it means that, that that we're nothing but evolved beasts. Then they have a different view. On mm -hmm. what it is, you know, in one way. So, for example, you know, like we tolerate, you know, and we encourage in our societies maybe gay marriage. They don't. Mm -hmm. Then, on what objective ground are you looking at Qatar saying they are wrong? Right. If you don't have any transcending objective view of ethics, then mm -hmm. you cannot point at any fingers and say they're wrong in any ways. Yeah. And so, so it's interesting because we want to have it both ways. We want. We do. To, we <laughs> want to do whatever we want, yeah. and we because we feel like these others are some kind of bothering me. I'm going to point fingers at them and tell them they're wrong as well. So my ethics is relative. But it becomes absolute when I want to lay it on you, and that has no absolutely no logical construct at all. Right? Yeah. No, that's so true. Hey, we appreciate if you're listening along today. Feel free to write in on the chat. I think we have the chat today. We're on YouTube Live Do and we? Facebook Live. I'm not sure. I'm looking at the chat, and it's it's a. Uh, I think it's from another show. I could be wrong, but either Thank way, you. <laughs> if you are following along today, feel free free to write in. At some point, we will get your messages, and we may or may not acknowledge you. We're not sure. Uh, <laughs> one thing I'd like to I'd like to ask you, Philippe, is yes. uh, because I'm I'm looking. We have we have a sheet that you put together for us. It's it's really yeah. comprehensive. Uh, one of the non-negotiables of a distinctive or objective Christian ethical system, you say, is the yeah. character yes. and nature of God. So uh, one thing that comes to mind is Numbers twenty three nineteen, and it says, mm -hmm. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he yes. should repent. Yes. I'm not going to continue the verse. You have like the main idea right there. But how how is God's character playing a role in Christian ethics, and, and how does it how does it guide us? Well, it's interesting because if you if you study ethics a little bit, you realize that that uh, there's what they call the old ethifro um, dilemma is is if you believe in God is good because you know does God decide what is good or is God good because good is objective, mm -hmm. right? And as Christians, we believe that God uh, good is what it is because of who God is. Okay. So we we answer this in this way. And by saying the very nature, and that makes complete sense if I explain it logically by saying God created the world, he created the world with his own rules. Just like whoever invented Monopoly right. uh, wrote the rules and that's how you play. You can yes. cheat if you want, that's called cheating. Yes. So God is not cheating with himself, <laughs> he created the universe and he gave us, and the Bible says that he created us in his image and every theologian would agree on the fact that creating in his image means mean, we, we look like him morally, not physically, of course, because God God is not a physical uh, body. He's yeah, he's immaterial in that sense. Right. Um, yeah. So so uh, um, uh, yeah. So the idea of the non-negotiable is that we believe that God created the world, right? Yeah. And that's that makes that makes the world what it is. Like we and and since we fell in sin, you know, in Genesis three, mm -hmm. uh, now we have this idea of we're separated from God in in what. Theologian would call autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. well, I'm autonomous from right. God in that way. So if we have time, we can talk about this later. But the point here is, I, I cannot know the thoughts of God unless He reveals them to me. Mm -hmm. So in this place now, where the Word of God become becomes that the, God's revelation as as we use it, and that Word of God becomes the guiding in in, in you know in in uh, what we decide is right and wrong in in that sense for us as Christians. So yeah, those non-negotiables, they're very simple. Number one, we have the Word of God. Right. We believe this is the authority, and we go back to what I said earlier. We have theology, ethics, and morals. 
Number two, we have the character of God, yeah. which when I, I spoke about redemptions, redemption and earlier, yeah. Yeah, and forgiveness, which is a big part of, you know, like God says, when Jesus says to love our enemies, this is not something we do, you know, naturally. Mm -hmm. But God says, you know, that we, we, we love our neighbors and we love, uh, you know, we could quote Jesus so many times in, in the gospel. He's trying to explain the Pharisees that the yeah. problem he has with them. Yes. Like he's there, you know, whoever is sick needs a doctor, not whoever is in good health. Mm -hmm. So he goes to the to the sinners, he goes and reaches out, and he never really addresses the sin itself. He addresses the bigger picture, which is we need God, right? Yeah. So that's we have the Word of God, you have the character of God, and also uh, we have this idea that as Christians, we live before God, and that's also a very distinctive uh, approach. Like, I'm here to glorify Him, and therefore I want to obey. And obedience is a big part of Christian ethics. Mm -hmm. I'm doing things even though I would say, you know, it doesn't make me look good, especially nowadays where the Christianity is opposed to the world. You know, mm -hmm. where, you know, like the world gives you a, a, a chance to either endorse or hate, yeah. you know, in one way. We say, well, there's a third way we can love and disagree at the same time. Yes. But that's also something that we find that, that is distinctive in Christian ethics. I find it interesting. You have Jesus being uh, crucified in John chapter 19. And one thing he says in the middle of his crucifixion is, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. You have a similar example take place in Stephen's life as he's being stoned to death. Mm -hmm. Maybe Acts chapter 7 or 8, he's being stoned to death. He says the same thing. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Now, on one side, you have men murdering uh, you know, the Son of God. You have yes. men murdering a prophet. Ethics or morals or the law would even say, like, oh, that's murder. That's wrong. Uh, they justified it in the case of Christ. Yes. That, you know, they sent false witnesses in. They did a whole bunch of things to make it seem right. But Christ comes in with something higher. Christ comes in with like this idea of forgiveness, and it goes way beyond our understanding yes. <clears throat> of regular morality. So, so who's you know how how do we how do we process that situation taking place? Murder's wrong, but mm -hmm. Christ is saying, "Forgive them, Father. Yes. They know not what they do." How how does that play into? What we're talking about. Well, it's a, I mean, it's a very good question in one way. So if we go back to where we said, okay, God created the universe mm -hmm. to share with us in the limited way the life he has. In, you know, like, So he created us. You know, we're limited, of course. Then he created us in a perfect environment. And then we seen. So now he, he reveals who he is. Because he... It, what I'm saying is that the commandments, commandments in the Bible, yeah. whatever we have in the Bible, are not there as a restriction. They're there as guidance right. to get to take us where God want, wanted us to be, which is the garden. You know, yeah. Right? So we don't have that anymore. We live in the fallen world. We have consequences, and God says, "Well, you know, like uh, since in the world there is, you know." We introduce sin in the world, mm -hmm. and that we, and then that God introduced forgiveness in, mm -hmm. in that way. And our dealing with this is like our goal, the God's purpose in life is re, is for us as Christians is to reflect Him. Yeah, not reflect our feelings and how you know like the 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 end of justice is very important in the Bible, but sure. not in the way we understand it because there is a bigger picture. Yeah, a, and ethics is influencing what we believe also in the way like okay, for example, I if you believe that there's this life is all there is then you're going to think about vengeance in one way. Mm -hmm. If you believe that God has is the ultimate judge and there's a life after this one, then it impacts the way you see forgiveness. Yeah. Like, for example, you know, people can say, look at this, you know, Hitler was the most horrible character of the 20th century. He lived a horrible life and he decided his fate on his own because he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if... if you know, I don't know if he repented of his sins. I don't know. Right. I don't, I don't, it's not important for me to think this way. But like the way we understand it, I don't have to be angry at history because he actually killed himself. Mm -hmm. I can trust that God, he's capable of dealing with this. So in a way, even the way we see the Holocaust and the fact that he got away with murder, it doesn't work in a Christian environment right. where God has. So, so it puts me in the place where it's okay for me to look at things that don't go my way in this world or I hate in the world and realize, okay, well, the wicked will answer to God at some point. And God says, yes, he will, but maybe he would get saved. Right. And I that's the beauty of the salvation that we are praised. Therefore, the God, God's heart is to fix sin by salvation, yes. not by punishment. Vengeance, right. Exactly. So so that truly influences the way we see society by saying, okay, what people need is is the Lord. They don't need a better behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's one mistake that I think a lot of Christians are making when we look at the world today. Of course, we speak up against evil. We do that. Of course. But yeah. if it becomes my my message, 
then I'm being I, I'm a legalist because I'm telling people to behave like Christians without being saved. Mm-hmm. And that is what legalism is. Yeah, and we don't want that. No, we don't. We're not interested. We have a really uh, we have a really hard question here come in from Elizabeth. I don't think it's not a hard question. It's more of a hot topic question. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth writes in, can you discuss Christian ethics related to the belief in the sacred life of the womb? So I think really, you know, she wants to talk about abortion, abortion or yeah. what, where, you know, where the Bible stands on abortion, where the world stands on abortion. What do you have to say about that? Well, it's for me, it's a very simple uh, answer is that, yes. Um, um, okay, so we believe as Christians, we're Christian. We be- believe God defines what is life and what is death. Right? Yes. We know yeah. that death is not in our hands and we're not supposed to murder. We know that for mm-hmm. a fact. On the other hand, you have what we call a hedonism. We'll talk about this a little more tomorrow. The philosophy that my pleasure is the most important thing that happens to me. Therefore, so I think for me, the, the problem with abortion is very simple. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, are we killing a baby? Yes, we are. So that's, that there's no other way to, to present abortion. Now, the moral behind it is, is where we believe that God, life is sacred according to what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. So for me, our position as Christians, there's no room for abortion in a Christian uh, environment. <clears throat> now, what do we do with people that did abortion? Yeah. You know, like we look at this and we say it's horrible, but, you know, in a way... I would see, I would visit someone in, in, in you know, a serial killer in, in, um, in, in a prison somewhere and preaching the gospel anyway. So right. it's, yes, of course it's a sin, but just like any other thing, it's covered by the blood of Christ. 100%. Uh, yes. Yeah. The only thing that I find as a root, though, is that we look at abortion as a problem, and I think abortion is a system, is a symptom that a deeper problem is I want to live the life the way I want it. So mm-hmm. I'm going to have sex with everybody I want. <clears throat> I don't care if I'm protected or not. Yeah. I will just deal with the consequences. Yeah. And I think the I, the prom- promiscuity or the, the unbridled sex that we see in our society brings up the solution that we have today is that we have issues like this. Of, of course, people say it's more complicated. What about the woman that has been raped? Right. I'm not an expert on the topic at all. I don't right. want to say anything out of my, you know, I have a limited understanding. But mm-hmm. these are the two basic ideas that I have that are completely uh, biblical for me. Life is sacred. And we are there mostly because we want to live the life we want to live. Right. And that's hedonism. Yes. And I and I think a really key point to, to any of these hot topics is you have to start with what the Bible says. Yes. Before you know, before any of these situations come up, before you're confronted with any of these things, yeah. you have to know for yourself, study to show yourself approved. What does God think about this? What is the character and nature of God? It, when he created life in Genesis. Yeah. He said, this is good. And whenever he talks about life in Psalm 139, he says he talks about forming us in the womb, yes. in the secret yes. places even. Yes. Like, like in God's mind and heart, we may be created well before we're ever even like physically created by our mother and father, you know? Uh, so <clears throat> instead of creating an ethic after you know, circumstances yes. happen and we decide, oh, we have to find a way to justify. Yes. Romans 2 says we have to find a way to excuse ourselves from it or accuse other people to to have ourselves escape from whatever the obligation is. Yeah. Then you can see where that becomes a recipe for disaster. Yes. You're, you're like, you're, you know, hindsight. Oh, I got to, I got to make up something for this situation so that it seems right. So that it seems ethical. Yeah. I think we develop our society based on what we believe is the right thing to do without looking at the consequences of what we do. Mm-hmm. And the same thing in science, in medicine, for example. Like 50 years ago, somebody who had a heart attack or, or a cardiac arrest, we tried CPR, and that's it. Now we plug them in the machines and, and, then, and then we try to keep them alive. They live a life you know, of completely you know, supported by machines. And then yeah. 20 years later, we, we decide whether we are, it's, it's ethical to unplug them or not. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, so the point I'm making here is that we, we, we invent things to prolong life and then we find ourselves in ethical dilemmas. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't progress in medicine. Well, I, this is a good thing to do. But I mean, I, the point is we put the uh, we, we, we put everything reversed. We're yeah. going to go with what we call progress, quote unquote. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah. And then we move on with things and we realize, oh, my God, what are we made of? So we, 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 yeah, we liberated, you know, the morals now we are we have to deal with it you know in, in with with the ethical challenges and that's 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 that is why when you stick with the what the bible says then you're in different predicament mm-hmm. completely different as a christian you don't have to deal with all the things because you already have an ethics that allows you to live uh, you know 
according to the biblical principles, then you don't have to suffer the consequences. Right. So, so a Christian who's studying ethics from a biblical perspective, hmm. uh, you would think at some point uh, it goes beyond head, head knowledge. Yes. You think at some point it would start to affect their daily life. Now, we mentioned this, like the transformation takes place yes. from the inside. It starts with truth in our inward parts, Psalm mm-hmm. 51, yes. and then it permeates to our outer, like our, our words, our thoughts, our actions, mm-hmm. and it permeates itself outward. So we have a couple verses that are that are key to the conversation. The okay. first one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. And this basically says, as Christians, we're ambassadors, and yes. it reads, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Yes. So how, how, how does this ambassadorship or this diplomatic uh, title play out in a Christian's life? Well, uh, in a way, okay, so you think about diplomats, you know, especially yeah. an ambassador. Well, he doesn't have a will of his own. He has qualities that allows him to represent his country well. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't go to places and declare war because you don't like the other, you know, the country you're in. It, your word has your word as an ambassador means nothing when it comes down to uh, you don't have the authority. Right. The way you go about doing your job, which is representing your country, is very key and makes you a diplomat. Yes. So hence, we have the adjective "ho" oh, is very diplomatic in that way. Yeah. If you're careful. So I see this as the same thing as Christians. What do we have? We're not from here. We're citizens of heaven. Mm-hmm. We're not in the world, but, you know, we're not from the world, but we're in the world. Just same thing. Just like, you know, like a French ambassador in Washington. He's not an American. He's a French guy. Right. You know, he's not in, you know, he's not from America. He's in America. Yeah. Same thing with any ambassador. So as Christians, this this is what we have, you know, and we are not there to make our own message. I'm not here to to declare war against, you know, uh, ethics, you know, ethical issues that I find in society. I'm here to pre- represent Christ. So uh, so here, this is what the verse says. You know, we are ambassador for Christ as though God were pleading through us. Mm-hmm. I don't have a message of my own. And what it means in ethics, very simple, is I'm there to represent Christ. So, of course, we said earlier we speak up against evil, but this is not it does not become the content, the main content of my message. Right. Uh, I think people will be transformed in Christ if they get saved, you know, and then they will think like a Christian would in many ways because mm-hmm. they would submit to God. But that's the order in which we have to to remember, you know, things. Let me ask you a question, because I think uh, this verse or this concept, being an ambassador for Christ, as a new believer, you may not completely understand this. Yes. You may you may not be ready to just like throw out old habits and take on the new creation and right. take on a new identity. As Christians, so that we don't become Pharisees, how do, how do we deal with new believers? How do we help them along? Yeah. Uh, to help increase their understanding and increase their, uh, not increase, uh, help them to draw closer to God in their walk so that they can, they can have his heart. They can, they can understand. Like we're all, we all fail at this yeah. every day of our lives. Mm-hmm. We all turn tail and run the other way yes. at different points, depending on what the situation is. So how, how can we uh, be ambassadors to other Christians as well, who like you're teaching a class on yeah. this. And most of these students maybe have never heard the biblical approach to these topics. Mm-hmm. So how, how, do, how do you walk them through that? How do you have the patience to, to get them to where, where God yeah. would have them, maybe? Well, that's what discipleship is, is there for, right? We, yeah. We, we do. You look at Christ and how he did with his disciples. It's teaching and showing and leading by example. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the most important things we can do is to actually teach the Bible and let people find God you know, for themselves. Yeah. Because when we lead by example, we, we want people to follow our faith, not our habits or mm-hmm. the way we do things. So the key, with ethics is true as well. It's like it's helping people think with the Bible. Not think, you know, we go back to what we said earlier. Not I'm not telling my students what to think. I'm telling them what, what I think and why. Why? Yeah. And hopefully I will bring them to, to the Word for themselves. I will bring them to God in that way, and then they can develop their own convictions. And that's, that's this this is what we want to do. I mean, and you, you're directing MBCNS in the Bible College. That's what you want to do. You want allow you want places for your students to be able to learn for themselves, and you know, leave and graduate from Bible College and take, you know, um, yeah, yeah, have a deeper relationship with God. Sure. I, yes. I like the way that Paul puts it. He says, "Follow me as I follow Christ," and his purpose in saying that to the Corinthian church is 
uh, that he wants every Christian, any Christian that he comes in contact with, anyone who's an unbeliever, he wants them first to look to Christ, yes. first to look to the Word of God, yes. first to look to that relationship and rely on Pro Proverbs chapter 3, like, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways yeah. acknowledge Him. Mm -hmm. they, he wants uh, to push His people towards Christ. He says to the Galatian church, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from mm -hmm. the gospel. If even I myself were to preach to you another gospel, or any other man or woman were to come in here and preach another gospel, like stick stick with the yeah. the Lord that saved you. Stick with mm -hmm. the the Christ that yeah. came into your heart and like started a brand new a brand new thing, a, a brand new way uh in Isaiah forty three yeah. in your life. Uh one of the one of these other verses that we have is uh, Matthew chapter 5, yeah. and it's uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's verses mm -hmm. 13 through 16. I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to ask uh, you, Philippe, for your commentary. Okay. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. <clears throat> and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So yeah. salt and light, what what do we have there? Well, yeah, I mean, there's many commentaries, and then they go all over the place in, in many places. Uh, what was salt used for, you know, like uh, to enhance the dish or mm -hmm. to conserve the meat? I mean, regardless, the f a few points you can get out of that, that chapter. Yeah. Uh, number one is that, Salt, which we are, cannot afford to to lose your say your flavor, right? That's that's what he says. Here. Yeah. Like if the salt loses its saltiness or its flavor, what are we going to salt? It, you, you know, there's nothing to salt the salt. Right. <laughs> right. So 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 that for me it speaks about you know it goes back to the ambassador idea. It's like uh, I think in in our church last night, you know, um, uh, Sunday morning, Pastor Shallow said one thing that is distinctive in the world is is that we have a message. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So that is the idea. So for me, the way I understand the salt is like, okay, I'm a meat eater. I love sorry for it. If he, vegetarians out there or vegans, <laughs> uh, don't judge me. It, it, um, um, but the point is, one thing in the successful cooking of a steak is is the salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you can have butter or whatever you want. The salt, you know, if you want to, if you go to basic, salt is key. <laughs> salt is key. If you have one ingredient <laughs> beside your meat, is salt. Yeah. More important than butter and herbs you can put in it, that's the key. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, it's not because it has flavor in itself. It enhances the flavor of what you eat. Right. And I think as Christians, it's what we do. Right. We are ambassadors. We have diplomatic uh, capacities. We're explaining the message, right? And But we need to be a salt in that way that we, 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 we enhance the flavor of the message. Like my life becomes an open epistle. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like you quoted First Peter five earlier. Like the 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 you need to be ready to give an account for the hope that is in you, mm -hmm. meaning that they see a hope. Yes. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask the question. Right. And that's the idea of assault. In, yeah. In, in in that way, right? So so um um yes, yeah, so, and so we cannot basically means we cannot compromise. It's the other side of 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 Christian ethics. We don't impose our ethics without sharing the gospel. We want this to be transformation. On the other hand, we're not backing down mm -hmm. as Christians. We have this. I'm not saying I'm pleading for a Christian nation without Christians being saved. Right. But I'd rather live in a society where there's an alternative being heard because sometimes people will hear the gospel by hearing an alternative when it comes to ethics as well. So we shouldn't back down in that way. We have salt. We have a message. And we're going to enhance the flavor of what we're serving. And that, that that's our life. So as the director of the Young Adults Ministry, yes. how does this particular message translate into their lives they're on they're on college campuses mm -hmm. they're in the workplace yes. they're in the world yes. on a regular daily basis just like most of us are on a regular basis not you know bible college is like kind of a small uh group of people who are wanting to learn their faith in a deeper yes. way but yes. most of our young adults in society today even if they have a, a christian upbringing and a biblical understanding yes. how how does this salt and light uh doctrine or idea yeah. come into play in their daily lives. Yeah, if you were to put like it was salt and light at the same time in one right. way. So but the point is like so that's the other part of the mess of the, the verse is like when you light up you you know when uh, you other light the world, a city that's based on, on a hill can be hidden, nor do they lend light a lamp and put it under a basket. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but you live on on Amsterdam. So so I think one thing that is very challenging when we look at the world today and realize, okay, I'm gonna shut down my corner, go through my college, and don't uh, don't ask me any question. Well, that's honestly something you can do. You cannot go around with signs all over the place. I think people do. I think it's ridiculous. But you know, yeah. like you know, and you go every single day with a big T-shirt, you mm-hmm. know, in your class of philosophy, like abortion is murder. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're making a point, but I don't think nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to right. see that. I don't think you're going anywhere with this. Right. But I can be so. But I so I still I'm ambassador, so I live differently. But then what's going to happen is the front of it. There's a light somewhere over there. People looking at it. So wait, wait a minute. You know, uh, you know, like your your attitude, your demeanor. You know, your the. So you express your differences, but you're bringing it with with love, you know. Yes, that's appealing. Because yes. when people, you know, when you're younger, one thing you don't realize is that the world is very appealing until it used you. Mm-hmm. And then when you're tired of the world, you look <laughs> at other people and realize maybe there's something else. Yeah, this is when this is where we need to be as Christians. And that's what I said to the young adults: like you may be out there working, you know, uh, or in college or anything. You can live your life differently, and that that is enough. Yeah. Yeah, and people ask questions. You get ready for for an answer because we have to. I, yeah, I was thinking, and and you nailed this, but but uh, Jesus says like, you shall know my disciples by this one thing, by the fact that they love. Well, so yeah. like these conversations are going to come up in yes. society. These hot topics are going to be debated, or maybe it's just going to be a one sided conversation most of the Could time. Be. But you have the opportunity, you have the ability to be able to speak up. In a loving way, the same way that Christ is on the cross saying, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. You have something to say to add to the conversation that most of the people are have not heard before. Yeah. Most of the people, if they have a Bible, it's sitting on their shelves, it's yeah. collecting dust, mm-hmm. it's like a prop in their Airbnbs or whatever it may be. Uh, you have an opportunity to like to shed some light, to, to enlighten their eyes, it says mm-hmm. in Ephesians chapter yes. 1. Yes. So I think it's a really, really great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who's, you don't have to be bold to do this. You don't have to be, you also don't have to be scared to open your mouth if you're just going to have a conversation with someone. When it becomes argumentative and whenever it becomes about, you know, like trying to use the Bible to beat someone over the head with what it says, you know, then you're missing out on on the character and nature of God and the way that he wants to talk about it and the way that he wants to shed some light on on the topic. Uh, we have a really interesting question here. Okay. Uh, Christy writes in, could you speak to what accountability that God has put in the heart in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16 and Jeremiah 31, 31? Is this for all people mm. in reference to the conscience and the work of the yes. Holy Spirit? Yeah, uh, it, Yeah, it's a very good question. So I'm going to turn to Hebrews and maybe you want to turn to Jeremiah. Okay. And we can read that. How about sure. that? Sounds good. <laughs> Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. I'm, it's just a suggestion. Okay, I, I'm doing it. All right, all right. I'm doing what all you right, say. Right. This is this is your party. I'm just <laughs> here to is... hang. <laughs> okay, Hebrews ten sixteen. This is the covenant that, that I will make with them after those days. Mm-hmm. Says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's obviously talking about Christians, not yes. about non Christians. So yeah. that's that that's that's the very idea here. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, the accountability. So the the other thing is 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 uh, maybe that would help in a way. Way okay. As a Christian, I have a duty to, to preach the gospel. I have a duty to share the gospel. I don't have a duty to fix the problems of the world. I don't have to do the duty to look at the world, take on myself to make sure the society gets better. Mm-hmm. I do need to be a salt. I I need I need to be light. Of course, I have to obey and and not compromise. That's very clear. Yeah. And but the other thing is, I also realize in you know, Romans one eighteen, they know the truth, but they suppress it. Right. So. That's a psychological effect of, of of unbelief in that way. And I have to be aware of that. And so so the thing is, I'm saying this because in conversation, sometimes things don't go uh, don't go well. We see that with our families, you know, that, you know, in our family, sometimes we have radicals in one way, have a couple of cousins who are this way, you know, in, in, it doesn't affect our, our, our love or our family relationship at all in a way, because I don't want, I'm not there to pick up a fight. Number one, I'm not there to win a fight either. Mm-hmm. That is a very important thing to do because what <clears throat> we want to do sometimes is win because we're so entitled to the fact that we we ha- we are right that we forget to re- represent Christ. Right. So I got to be careful with that. You know, we say the same thing in apologetics. I'd rather say nothing and lose a battle to win the war yeah. than actually uh, win a battle and won- and lose the war. So I'm not interested in having that. Sure. Yeah. So Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. Behold, the days come, says the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with yep. the house of Judah. Mm-hmm. So very clearly, the new covenant in the Old Testament 
sp- spoken of by Jeremiah is for Israel, yep. right? For Israel. And then when you get to Hebrews chapter 10 and you read about the new covenant again, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 10, it's all over the place yep. in the book of Hebrews. We start to realize that this prophecy that Jeremiah spoke was one of those hermeneutic ideas that you can uh, speak something for the near future yep. as well as for for you know, far away future. Yes. And this idea of the new covenant, what God puts in all of our hearts, that we would one day be with him and like him and and knowing his word without even having to be taught it mm-hmm. because it's just in us. Yes. This is for everyone. Yes. Uh, and, and our producer writes in Ecclesiastes 3.11, also he has put eternity in our hearts. Yes. Every single person has the capability, the, the capacity yes. to receive the things of God. Yeah. If they want to receive yes. them, if they yeah. choose faith, yes. if they choose to believe, I mean, knowing the truth and receiving the revelation of God is not an option. Yeah. Everybody will. Yes, and I will have a choice: either I will reject or I will accept. Right. It's very simple. Yeah. yeah. So when so when it comes to Christian ethics, it's it's very similar. Yes. Uh, we'll all be confronted in one way or another as to well, here's the way society thinks, and here's what the Bible says. Yes. You, you essentially just have to make a choice at, yes. at some point in time. Yes. Any last words, last thoughts? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, for today. We, we, for, for today. today. Okay, for well, today. It's dramatic. A bit. Yeah, uh, I know. Now just, we come back tomorrow and dramatic. just carry on the conversation asking you, how do we decide what is right and what is wrong? Yeah. I want to say just like one more thing about this. Sure. You know, when we interact with people, you know, and then we realize that the world is against what we're saying, the point is just like anything we see in the Bible, the works follow salvation mm-hmm. change follow salvation mm-hmm. and i want to add that ethics and morals will follow salvation yes. they don't precede it right so if we have that right in our order then we we focus on the right thing which is sharing christ and then we let god do his work john 16 8 he's the one that the spirit is the one that convicts of sin righteousness and judgment not us amen so hallelujah hallelujah take that all of you pharisees yes. out there <laughs> no, i'm yeah, just kidding but but jesus has some it. interesting things to uh, say to you well yeah he did yeah, i well. shouldn't ended it that way. Philippe did an amazing job ending it the way that he did. (laughs) Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Philippe, thank you so much for uh, guiding us in this conversation today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other podcast outlets. Be sure to join us tomorrow as we are back here again, strangely enough, to talk about who determines what is right and what is wrong. Amen.